Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, we have a special speaker here who's got a hot topic to talk about that's soon to be, I'm sure, quite explosive in our area given the weather. It hasn't been all that cold. Um, so this is Matthew Osborne. He's a Master's of Public Health epidemiologist uh, with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And he oversees the epidemiology program uh, their Zoonotic Disease Project and the Arbovirus Surveillance Program. He's been involved with mosquito and tick-borne diseases for more than 15 years, working in the field laboratory, um, epidemiology settings. He has developed vector-borne disease health education initiatives to reduce the incidence of tick-borne disease in children and the elderly. Um, he's passionate about workforce development for the next generation of public health professionals assisting with learning opportunities, including internships with state and federal local partners. Um, and his recent projects include emerging pathogens and invasive vectors. Um, so if we could please welcome Matt to Bristol. Um, we appreciate him coming down today. Thanks. You got all of that right, and maybe I miswrote it. But I don't, if my boss is watching, I don't want her thinking that I run the epidemiology program. Uh, well, so she I. She doesn't have to know. Yes, I am. Uh, so I am an epidemiologist. Uh, I've been uh, with our epidemiology program for about 10 years. I started at the State Health Department over 15 years ago, actually working in a field position, which I love. And now I work behind a desk, which I love less. <laughs> but I still love my job. Um, I did a lot of mosquito-borne disease initially, and I do focus on mosquito and arboviral disease at the State Public Health Department. But you know, before we get started, I want to you know, make sure everyone in the audience knows, and I heard we have some public health nurses here. I love, or nurses in general, yes. student nurses. Nurses are like my favorite people. Um, you guys do so much for us. Um, doesn't matter what setting you're in. Uh, we love you guys. So um, if you have any questions about how you can become engaged in public health, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you. I, I ran internship programs for a really long time, and I'm always looking to try to snag nurses for lower paying jobs at the state health department. But you know, since I've worked on arboviral disease and mosquitoes for so long, uh, it, it, this last year, we had a, a very heavy West Nile virus year, and we had about four, we had 49 human cases. And it seems like a lot, and it is a lot, and it's a debilitating disease if you get it. But when you think that an average year, we might get 30 to 50 human cases of either West Nile virus or Tripoli, and that's on the high side in some cases, we're getting thousands of cases of tick-borne disease. So clearly, tick-borne disease is where the burden of disease in Massachusetts from a zoonotic perspective is. And that's where we focus most of our effort. A surprising amount of the public really wants to talk about mosquito-borne disease. And although it's my passion, I focus on what impacts everyone's health in this realm. So today I'm going to talk about a number of diseases that you see up on this screen. But I'm going to really focus on the ones that are in red. Uh, Lyme disease is obvious. Everybody in this room should know Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, Powassan virus, and Borrelia miyamotoi is something that we have recently started following. There are other tick-borne diseases that are important in the state and in our surrounding jurisdictions. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is very rare in Massachusetts. I think during my time, we've only ever had two cases, uh, and it's spread by a, a different tick one that you won't see in, your, in this area. Uh, tularemia is a very, also a very rare disease, very debilitating disease, can be spread by ticks or other mechanisms. It's a soil borne and can be in carcasses of animals. Uh, so the population that would get that disease is a little bit different. Uh, so we're not going to really talk too much about tularemia because it's so rare. And then ehrlichiosis is carried by the Lone Star tick, which is a, a very uncommon tick in Massachusetts. It's certainly uh, rising in its prevalence in the, mass, in the mass area, but right now it's very relegated to some parts of the Cape and the islands. And it's really like very small islands uh, that, are, that have a lot of deer populations. So that if you go out on those islands that you're not supposed to be out on anyway, you're going to find Lone Star ticks. Uh, but we don't see them on the mainland too much. 
So I'm going to go over some somewhat rudimentary concepts, and I'll apologize in advance if there are people in the room that already know all of this, so I won't focus too, too much on it. I'm not going to bore you to death with it. But I think it's very important for people to understand what ticks look like, the size difference, uh, how you go about detecting them. Uh, we're really going to focus today on the deer tick. The deer tick is what is spreading every single one of those diseases that I showed you. The other common tick that you're going to encounter, and I'll show you that tick, is the dog tick. And that one's easier to detect. It's much larger. But it's not spreading any of the diseases that you really need to be worried about. And it's easier to spot. Uh, the deer tick is a very small tick. It's also known as the black-legged tick. And you'll see it's different life stages here. Uh, the adults are about the size of a sesame seed, and the adult females are the ones that are spreading the diseases. They have a reddish abdomen. That's the easiest indicator that you have a deer tick. And when I was younger, the dog tick was easily the most common tick. It was the one that I got bitten by all the time. My parents took off me in a variety of ways that, are, that we will not talk about here. Um, there are good ways to take ticks off of you, and we'll cover that. But what you're seeing is the adult female. And up here, that's a male that will just crawl around and do nothing to you. And this one here, that is the most dangerous life stage. That's the nymph. So the nymph feeds on infected mice, drops off, and is already infected and ready to transmit these diseases to you. The problem with this this particular tick is its size. It's not necessarily a better vector than the adult. It's not better at transmitting. It's the size. So I've had Lyme twice that I'm aware of. And both times they were on, located on my thigh for a very long period of time. And I had a perfect bullseye rash on one thigh uh, that I never took a picture of. And I regret to this day, which is weird. Uh, but it had to have been a nymph because nobody walks around for 72 hours and I shower every day and don't see a tick feeding right where I should see the tick. Same problem two years later, different thigh, different looking uh, EM rash, but it was at the same time that the nymphs were active and I never saw the tick. And this is the most common notation that we hear from residents. I had Lyme disease, I never saw the tick. You know, it could be an adult. It could be, most likely, it's a nymph. Uh, this is the dog tick here. And you can see how much bigger it is than the deer tick, how much easier it is to spot. Uh, it has striations on its abdomen that are much easier to spot as well. You can actually, most people can feel the dog tick crawling on their skin. Some people can't. Uh, they do, do move pretty rapidly, but the deer tick is so much smaller, it, does, it goes unnoticed often. So you can see here, it's easily double the size. And that's really the problem with this tick, is I really wish this was reversed. But it's not. So very basically, where do ticks live? Everywhere in Massachusetts. If you go outside, that's where they live. Um, in my area, I just went outside yesterday. So in anticipation of coming to talk to you, I figured we had a nice day. We had a nice day uh, Saturday. And then Sunday was kind of nice in the morning. Uh, so I took my equipment out and I flagged my yard. And I decided to see, are there ticks out there? And I was very successful. I picked up ticks right away. And then my dog picked up a tick when they came back in the house. So they are active. Uh, and we'll show you a little chart about when they're active. But unlike mosquito-borne disease, we talk to the public about mosquitoes coming to you and, and everyone's at risk because mosquitoes can fly. Ticks, you have to enter their habitat. So that's really the risk with ticks in Massachusetts and, and all over the Northeast. You've got to enter their habitat, but there's so much of it. They're really in shaded areas that are damp. They need the humidity to survive. If you prepare your yard correctly, if you have these grassy areas that are open to sun, they really cannot cross that area, especially in the daylight. They will desiccate, they will die. A lot of it is about yard preparation. So when you're talking to residents and you go out and they say, I don't know how I possibly could have gotten this disease, and you're like, well, there's a, 
there's logs over here, there's your firewood right next to your house where the mice live, and then there's a rock wall right there where the mice live and the ticks live, and then you've got a fence line that's nice and shaded, and it's good and humid, and your kids play right along there. Well, that's right in your own yard. You don't have to go any further than that. So there are tools and mechanisms that people can use to create some barriers. And that's not always possible given your habitat or your home style. So we're aware of that. But there are ways to lessen the risks around your personal homes. And then when you go out into the environment, there are ways to lessen your risks. One of the challenges that we have at the State Health Department is, you know, we want everyone to be healthier. And one of the ways to be healthier is to go outside and exercise. Um, we don't want people getting afraid and staying in their house because they're worried about ticks. Because don't think that when you're in your house, you're tick free. If you have a dog, if you have two like I do, corgis low to the ground, um, they're basically like tick magnets. They just drag along the ground and the ticks attach to them. And then they're in your house. So if you have risk factors like ticks, even if you treat them appropriately, they can still bring them in your house. So one of the things that we hear oftentimes is, I don't go outside, I never, I never do that. And they're honest, they never go outside. But their dogs do, they root around in the underbrush, they come back in, they shake off, and the ticks fall off, and then they go sit on the couch. And while you're watching TV, completely at ease, they're feeding on you. So it's something to think about, that it is not just an environmental issue, it's your own personal risk factors. Not trying to scare everyone in the room <laughs> and on TV. So I think it's important for everyone to know when ticks are active uh, right now. So ticks are active right now. Uh, people wait too long to understand when ticks are actually active. Uh, they start at any temperature above 41 degrees, but they're still active in the leaf litter all year round. So if you disturb their habitat, there's a good chance that you can get a tick on you, or especially your pets can get ticks on you, and then do that whole thing where they bring it back inside for you. Uh, nymphs are most active uh, right now, early April through June, and then the adults are active later in the season. But you'll see the adults early in the year. They're going to take blood meals. They're going to lay their next batch of eggs. Um, so, you know, there's a, and there's going to be a lot this year. The, um, the conditions were perfect for them over the winter. It wasn't too cold. There was, uh, there was enough snow on the ground. The humidity was very good. So they're going to do, have heavy survival. We went into the fall with pretty heavy amounts of ticks. So I, I think this year's going to be tough. So I'm not going to spend too, too much time on this slide. It's not overly complex, but not everyone needs to know about their two-year life cycle. But it's really what I want to draw your attention to is the larva right here. Since I keep coming back to the fact that the larva are the most dangerous life stage, it is really because they're feeding on the white-footed mouse and then dropping off. And this is when they have the opportunity here to attach to anybody right here. And we are dead-end incidental hosts. We're not able to accumulate enough uh, Borrelia burgdorf burgdorferi, and then spread it to ticks, other ticks that are feeding on us. But it's really the nymph stage that we have to worry about. So you'd be surprised how many myths there are about ticks that I hear almost on a daily basis. Uh, I go to a lot of health fairs. Uh, we really like to talk to the public. Ticks do not jump, they do not fly, and they do not drop on you. They, are, they will go up on a tall bl braid, blade of grass, and they will quest. They'll constantly be doing this. And when I went out the other day with my towel and I drag on the ground, they're latching onto the towel and then they'll bury right into the towel. So although I don't advocate most people doing this, if you want to know if you have ticks in your yard and you want to know how bad the situation is, take a towel that you don't use anymore. If you have a dog and you have a dog towel and you're going to get rid of it anyway, just drag it on your ground and see in the brushy areas and see if you have ticks. Obviously protect yourself, but you will find ticks if you live in the right environment. So it's a good way for people to understand their personal risk. Drag it along your fence line, see what your risk is. Um, when they grab onto you, that's when they're gonna start crawling and looking for an attachment place. So we're gonna move on to talking about the diseases that impact our residents. And Lyme disease is obviously our number one concern. So 
I could have thrown the Massachusetts map up here right away and just said, wow, Lyme disease is everywhere. I think this is a more striking map. When you see the burden of disease in the Northeast, but you don't see it anywhere else, it's hard for other people in other parts of the country to truly understand what it's like, this type of burden here. We have a lot of visitors that come to the state and they, they don't really understand these tick-borne diseases. They'll acquire a disease, they'll go back to their, they'll go back to Arizona, and it's very difficult to diagnose them because their providers are so unaware of it. Here we do have some hyper-awareness of the diseases, but still there, there are providers that are maybe not as up-to-date, and we do, we do a lot of outreach to our providers. But I think this highlights some of the major concern that we have in our area. So I thought it was important to let you know, you know, we're gonna go back and forth, deer tick, black-legged tick, same tick, Ixodes scapularis. You'd be surprised how many people actually know by now Bur Borrelia burgdorferi and Ixodes scapularis. Everybody comes up to me, and those are the two Latin names that they can shoot right out. This is the black-legged tick's habitat. So you'd pretty much expect to see that same distribution of cases. But if we overlay the cases on top of them, you don't really see the same thing. Ignore the fact that Massachusetts is, uh, doesn't appear to have any cases. We changed our surveillance strategy and uh, we're still, we still have a lot of cases. Uh, but what we're seeing here is, is that there's a clear line where there's a lot of ticks. That I've been in Florida for some time. I've had deer ticks on me. The burden is just not very high. We're talking, you know, handfuls of cases in counties, not hundreds or thousands of cases. So there's clearly something going on in our area that's allowing more transmission. So here's Lyme disease cases reported in the U.S., and I would expect that these are highly undercounted. So from 1997, we had about 12,000 human cases reported, and all the way to 2017, we're over 40,000 human cases. And I think that number's low. I think in Massachusetts alone, we have easily double or triple the amount of cases that we are producing on our website, and there are reasons that I'll talk to you why that's happening. Uh, some of this is an artifact of additional surveillance, and some of it's clear-cut increases in cases. So this is that mass map that I promised you, and you see these areas that you look like, wow, I could go there and I could be safe, but you're not. So Lyme disease is everywhere in, the, in Massachusetts, especially on the Cape and the Islands, and then right here is a hot spot where we are today, uh, but there are other areas that are hot spots. When you see these areas where you think it's low incidence, sometimes these are just low population density, and we have to suppress data due to, to some of our rules. But realistically, Lyme everywhere in Mass. So here's some data. We stopped doing our surveillance the same way we'd been doing it a long time in Massachusetts because we really thought we were undercounting cases and it just was not accurate to our residents to continue to do the same structure. So we're looking at new ways to model cases and to look at the labs that are coming in to get a better estimation of really what's the burden on our residents. But if you look at just this simple graph, 2010 to 2014, there's a clear cut rise. We didn't do any additional surveillance. This is the same surveillance that we always do. In 2010, we started with 4, 000, almost 4,000 cases, and by 2014, we've got nearly 6,000 cases. And we're fairly certain that we are underreporting that by at least a factor of two, if not more. And there's a good reason why that is. If you go to your doctor and you present with an EM rash, the erythema migrans, which I'll show you a picture of, your doctor knows what that is largely. Um, if you say I have a fever and I ache and I have all of these, and oh, by the way, I found a tick on me at the same time. But if you have that EM rash, that is a confirmatory result. So what your doctor's gonna do is they're gonna treat you for Lyme disease. Sometimes you come in without the rash, you give them the symptoms, they're still gonna treat you without Lyme disease, but we don't get the report. And all of those cases add up where we don't get those reports. But what we do get is if they submit for testing, we'll get those reports. So there's a lot of data missing and it's very difficult for a very, very busy provider to say, fill out case forms and send them in to us. So we understand that and we're trying new and better ways to get more data. 
So we're going to talk just a little bit about the agents, the vectors, and the reservoirs. For those of you who don't know or want to know more, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete, and deer tick Ixodes scapularis is the vector. And the white-footed mouse is going to come up over and over and over again. This is the reservoir for Lyme disease. So the tick is infecting the mouse, and the mouse is infecting all of the other ticks that feed on it. And it's really the mice that are the problem. A lot of people focus on deer, deer tick, makes a lot of sense. We reduce the number of deer in the environment. Magically, all the ticks are just going to disappear with them. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. We create very suitable habitat for mice. You really only need the mice. Uh, the deer are important in the tick's life cycle, but they're not necessary. So they can feed on other animals, uh, or they can feed on us and get blood meals. Uh, but what they're really looking for is, in that very juvenile stage, the mice. And there's so many mice. So I'm going to give you a couple of pictures that you probably don't want to see, but you're going to see them anyway. Uh, erythema migrans. We're just going to call it the EM rash. Now, not everyone gets this rash. And if, say, you get bitten by a tick, and the tick is on your scalp, under your hairline, you're never going to see it. Um, I actually had one on my back that my wife saw. And I don't think I ever would have seen it if my wife didn't say, hey, you've got an odd oval-shaped rash on the back of your, on your back. And I was like, oh, OK, that's fantastic. And she took a picture, took a picture for me. I said, yep, that's it, OK. It appears three to 30 days after the tick bite, and it has a variety of appearances. And only about 80% of the cases get it in the first place, and some people will never see it. So if it goes away too quickly, uh, you never see it in the first place, you're not going to know until symptoms start showing up. And the symptoms are very nebulous. They follow along very classic symptoms. Flu-like, fever, headache, fatigue, neck stiffness, achy joints. I have every one of those symptoms today minus fever, I think. Uh, so we all feel like this at some point in our lives or another. But what's important to notice is if you are feeling this way during the critical times of infection during the summer, you have to take it really seriously. You have got to go to your primary care physician and say, I live in a tick endemic area. I feel like this. I've had ticks on me. So you get appropriate testing and appropriate treatment. And we'll keep reinforcing that, get tested, get treated early. Don't get treated early, problems emerge. This is some of the EM rashes that we're talking about here. And although the screen doesn't show them as nicely as my monitor does, uh, that is kind of that classic bullseye right there. And that was one, I had a nicer one than that. And here is, this is another classic bullseye. This looks nothing like a bullseye. And neither does this one here. And sometimes you'll get several of these, not always at the site of the tick bite. So it doesn't, it's not one rash. It doesn't have one appearance. But if you have a rash at all, especially anything that looks like this, then you have potential exposure to Lyme disease. And you need to go see your primary care physician. You need to get in right away, too. Later symptoms are something you just don't want to happen. I think, you know, as we all get older, we have enough other stuff going on in our lives. I don't think we need this. Uh, additional joint pain, potential chronic erosive diseases, um, more importantly, heart issues. AV block is something we talk about. And unfortunately, with some of the investigations that we do, I find these cases. People may go undiagnosed or untreated for lengthy periods of time, and they get very, very ill. Um, it's not a lot of individuals, but it can be, uh, and we don't know the extent. So I think it's important always early detection, early treatment is what we keep talking about. So when do we have Lyme disease cases? Oddly enough, all the time. All the time. You would think they'd be only in the summer, but they're all the time. This is two different things going on here. What we're really looking at are People who are invading the habitat of the ticks during those winter months, they're acquiring the disease, they're getting tested. What you're also looking at are people who are diagnosed late in, the, in their symptoms. So here we have the giant peak that you would expect to see. And you know my little tick up in the corner there causing all the problems. 
So we have very, very large amounts of transmission going on in the summer. And really what you're seeing is because it takes so long, this is when transmission is occurring. This is when we're seeing the case symptom onset. So it's really the nymphs that appear to be driving this cycle. This is a really important slide, probably the most important slide I'm going to show you today. Lyme disease has a very classic appearance in different, in different age groups. There are two clear peaks here. We have our 5 to 14 age group, which are our kids. And our kids are at risk because they enter the habitat of the ticks more readily. Uh, you'll see after the 5 to 14 age group, during the 20s and into the 30s, when I'm sitting behind my desk, I'm less at risk for acquiring a tick-borne disease. But your children are much more likely to go out into the environment. Their hygiene, you know, I, I, I don't have any kids. Um, my wife hates me for that, but I don't have any kids. Um, we have tons of nieces and nephews, but their hygiene is not always what you want it to be. So when they come back inside and they've got ticks crawling on them, you do your absolute best to do your tick checks. But if you miss even one tick, that's the problem. So what I advocate for every parent I meet is if you have kids, when they come back in the house, grab them by the back, take all their clothes off, throw them in the dryer for 15 minutes, kill any ticks on them, and toss them in the shower. I don't care how much they don't like it, if they're playing in tick habitat, the last thing you need is for them to acquire a tick-borne disease. I'm not saying it's going to prevent all of your problems. I'm saying it is one step that we all need to take because we live in Massachusetts. Um, here's our next highest group. Now, this is a combination of immune status and uh, retirement. So you have more time when you get older. And unfortunately, as we are aging, and I feel like I'm aging really rapidly today, but um, our immune status goes down. Our immune health really starts to decrease. So we're more likely to pick up these tick-borne diseases. One of the highest risk uh, activities that this age group has is gardening. So they are out in the environment. They're doing exactly what they should be doing. I love gardening. I grow tons of stuff. But when I'm down in the dirt and down in the grass, that's where the ticks are. That's where I'm picking them up. And I'm moving brush all over the place. So what we do is we target these two groups very differently. And that's an important distinction is because there's no message that's going to work for this group and this group, except for the fact that this group is grandparents and they care about that one. And this is what I feel like every day, that the ticks are everywhere. I figured you would enjoy it. Babesiosis, maybe a disease that you don't hear enough about, but you should. Uh, it's a very important disease in Massachusetts. It is on the rise. It is spread by, the agent is Babesia, Babesia microti. And again, it's the deer tick. We're just going to keep hitting the deer tick over and over and over again. And the white-footed mouse holds this disease as well. So, Babesia is a very different disease than Lyme. Uh, the infection period ranges from one to nine weeks. You may have no signs at all. If you are in good health, if you um, have a well-functioning immune system, especially if you're younger, you tend not to have any of the symptoms. Your system may clear it on its own. Uh, if it doesn't, you can have fever, chills, headache, muscle aches. Does this sound familiar from Lyme disease? Same symptoms, different disease. However, it can progress. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark urine. Some of these are kind of classic symptoms for hepatitis. So we do hear about people going in for liver testing, and they end up getting tested for Babesia because of these symptoms. The elderly, the immunocompromised, individuals who do not have a functional spleen are at risk for the most severe complications for this disease. And because it's transmitted through blood transfusions, our blood banks do testing. And we follow any cases that are acquired through that, because those people can have really serious outcomes. If you think about people who are already very ill, who are getting this um, transmitted to them through a blood transfusion, some of them have had organ transplants. They're really ill. So it can be a very serious disease. This is something we do, do focus resources on. And here's a map for Babesia. It's very unlike the Lyme disease map. So you see a very high intense area. Again, we are here. Um, I've been to almost every town in Massachusetts except Gosnold. It's on my list because of all the work I did in the field. 
But in Fall River um, and in this area, there is a very high incidence of Babesia. So I live up here, and we have a lot up there too. Uh, so there's plenty of it to go around. And again, it's, it is in this, these outer areas, but the population is less. So you're just going to see less disease. So here are our cases up to 2017. They're somewhat stable, but they are on the rise. And I keep talking about this surveillance artifact. When you first find a disease, and we'll see this for one of them, you put a lot of resources into finding more. And what you see is if you look for it, you're going to find it. That's a surveillance artifact. We're not doing that for Babesia, Lyme disease, Anaplasma. We're not doing that. We're doing the same data that we're doing all the time. So what you're seeing here in 2013, and if we were to go back further, you'd see a, a much lower amount of cases. But in 2013, we had about 400 cases. In 2017, we've got over almost 600 cases. So it's an increase. And when I talked about 40 cases of mosquito-borne disease, well, right there, we knocked that out. So Babesia is a very important disease in Massachusetts, especially to the elderly population. So this is the time period for babesiosis. And you'll notice that you don't see the cases in these areas here where we, we were seeing cases before. Uh, it's transmitted in the summer months, like you'd expect. And then look here. You're not seeing that peak in kids because their immune system are well functioning. Uh, we do see children, but it's not as common. And typically, they're immunocompromised. Uh, individuals here are more likely to be immunocompromised. And that's why we're seeing that spike there. So we're targeting for educational purposes. That's how we're targeting. Anaplasmosis, and I apologize if I go really, really fast. I just go really, really fast through these diseases because I want to leave some time if you have questions. Um, or I, I think I actually left mosquito slides on this too. But anaplasmosis is, again, a very serious tick-borne disease. And again, I, I think people underestimate how severe these diseases can be. Uh, anaplasma is spread by the deer tick, again. The reservoir is more questionable for this one. The tick acts as its own reservoir, as does the white-footed mouse. So not only do we have anaplasma in the tick, it can spread in the mice, and then they can harbor it in the tick. They don't have to feed. They can pass it through the tick's life cycle. So it's an unfortunate situation where the tick can hold this as well. Uh, the incubation period is one to two weeks, so it's pretty quick. Uh, usually you have no symptoms whatsoever. Most cases are asymptomatic. Fever, headache, muscle aches, chills, sweating, here we go. Uh, nausea, vomiting. And again, it's the older age groups, um, people who are diabetics. You think, just keep thinking comorbidity, immunocompromised. Um, anybody who delays treatment are more likely to have the most severe outcomes. The only thing, if it's a positive at all, the antibiotic that's typically used for Lyme disease also treats anaplasma. So if your provider was to only order Lyme disease testing and you only got the antibiotic, but you were infected with both or one, uh, you would get cleared for this as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, one thing that I don't have a slide for, and I, I do somewhere else, but co-infection. The t same tick can carry all of these diseases at once. And they can spread all of these diseases to you. We've done a lot of work at the State Health Department looking at co-infections, people who get multiple forms of tick-borne disease at the same time. So sometimes they'll, you'll get, say, a treatment for Lyme disease. You'll feel better. Then you start feeling worse again, because you may not have cleared babesiosis at the same time. So it does happen. It's not super common, but it does happen. Anaplasma is pretty much all over the state, but we see pockets of activity. Cape and the Islands, unfortunately, the islands has a huge burden of tick-borne disease. Again, we always see it down here. We see a lot of transmission of these tick-borne diseases in your area. And then this area out in Berkshire County and up here every year, we see the same cycle. So. With anaplasma, we've seen a very clear upward trend. Uh, from 2013 to 2017, we're looking at, you know, 2013, we're looking at almost 400 cases. But by 2017, we're up to 1,200 cases. This is when I say no surveillance artifact. These are true cases. 
Anyone that you see in red, we've confirmed that to be a real case. Anyone that you see in yellow, that's a probable case that we just didn't get all the data for, but it's almost certainly a case. So there's, some, there's clearly increased transmission uh, and co-infections occurring. And what we see is a little bit different with this tick here, and with this tick-borne disease, uh, or earlier transmission, almost like Lyme disease, a lot of transmission here, and then this peak. What we're thinking here is this is usually the activity of individuals who are doing clearing property, things of that nature. It's also possible that different life stages of the tick are spreading the disease at a different time of year. We don't see that bump with most of our other diseases. Uh, so it is an open question as to what's going on with that particular uptick in anaplasma, but these are diagnosed and typically treated cases. And if you look again at the bottom here, who is getting it? Not so much children, elderly. So it's that immunocompromised status, but there's quite a few cases. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, Powassan virus has been in the news a lot lately. Um, a lot of people think they have Powassan virus. They do not, thankfully. Um, we have talked solely this today about um, bacterial diseases, things that can be treated with antibiotics. Powassan is a virus and a very serious one at that. It's spread by the deer tick. Um, you have to see up here woodchuck tick. If you find one, you're not going to be able to differentiate it from a deer tick. And they look very, very similar. And they shouldn't be biting you unless you're going into their dens. Uh, I've never seen one on me. So the symptoms develop between one week and a month following the bite of the infected tick. And most people have no symptoms whatsoever. So they're fine with POAS and they'll clear it on their own. It's those people that um, develop an encephalitis-like infection. Those are the people that are in really serious trouble. Uh, symptoms are again, fever, headache, uh, muscle weakness. Until it starts developing into more encephalitis-like disease, confusion, vomiting, seizures, loss of coordination, that's when things get really serious. Uh, there is no vaccine for this because it's a fairly low-level disease and right now there's not one available. It's supportive care only and unfortunately about 10% of our viral encephalitis cases with Powassan, there are, there are fatalities. So a rare tick-borne disease, but not something that we would see. So, you know, if you think about, say, a mosquito-borne disease, like eastern equine encephalitis, probably is the most severe arboviral disease in the U.S., and about 30 to 50 percent of our cases uh, do pass away. But here we have a tick-borne disease that's fatal, and we're not seeing that as much with our other bacterial disease. You will read in the literature and you will hear about cases um, of fatalities for babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and Lyme disease. Prior to just a few years ago, there was not a lot of thinking that Lyme disease led to fatalities, but there have been fatalities recorded to Lyme. So all of these diseases need to be taken seriously, but it's important to note how rare it is. So we get a lot of requests for testing, but we're not seeing that many cases of it. Um, and because they have such severe outcomes, we would catch more of it. Um, if you have encephalitis, you would go to the hospital. You would not be sitting at home. Uh, you would get tested for everything across the board, and this is one that comes up a lot now. Uh, we've had at least three fatalities that we know of. One thing I thought was important to point out is this ratio. I haven't talked about sex ratios because, you know, I have to know my audience and we don't really talk about sex ratios. For most of the tick-borne diseases, you see more males than females. Just because you have more outdoor workers that t tend to be men, no bias against anyone in the room, uh, but we tend to see a, almost an equal distribution. So think maybe 52 to 58 percent are male and then the, the rest would be female. Clearly not the case here. This cannot be adequately explained just by saying that they're all outdoor workers because I've investigated these cases myself and they're not out outdoor workers. So these are people around their homes doing normal activities. Um, most of them are immunocompromised, but there are plenty of females that are out outdoors doing the exact same work and we're just not seeing that. Um, again, it's such a low level case count that this might change in the future but it's noteworthy right now. So I can tell you, I do not have all the answers on this. 
Uh, most of our cases are the mean is 20, so, sorry, the mean is 64 years of age. So again, you're seeing that later stage, uh, people are getting ill when they're older. And the month of onset is summer and early fall, so typically following almost the Lyme pattern. So here's one that you may not have heard about before. Um, Lyme disease has been around for some time, not a tremendously long time that's been understood. It's a Borrelia species, but there are many, many other Borrelia species. Many are not thought to cause human disease, but we don't know how many of them do cause human disease. Borrelia miyamotoi has been known about for a long time, but we hadn't seen cases for some time, and we started to see cases in Massachusetts, and unfortunately, Massachusetts leads the nation with the most Borrelia miyamotoi cases, which is not what we want to be known for, um, spread by the same tick, Ixodes scapularis, and harbored by white-footed mice. Uh, so it was identified in, in 2011 as a human pathogen. It had been around before that, and the first case we, was identified in 2013, but it's important to see this data. This is 2013 to 2017, and we've had 78 cases. Uh, 48 of those are confirmed, and of the 30 that we list as probable, that just means we can't get enough data. Uh, so it's hard to get all that data. It's hard, as you recover, sometimes you don't like to call us back and tell us what you had, what your symptoms were. Uh, and again, look, 52% male, that's what we typically see, not like 90% male. Uh, the age range is very typical of our Lyme disease cases. So t it looks more like um, immune status is what's driving this, and we tend to see not a lot of children. So it looks to be a little bit different, but because we've had so few cases, and 78 cases is low when we think about tick-borne diseases. Uh, we don't know the true pattern yet of this disease. It follows very similar Lyme-like trends, uh, June, July, August, September transmission, and you know low levels of illness. So you can recover at home typically. We've only seen one hospitalization that we're aware of, and we have not recorded any fatalities. So it, it's following that Lyme-like trend but you have to get tested for it to know that you had it in the first place, and since it's such a rare disease, you may not get tested for it. So we've talked a lot about the diseases. Everybody in the room knows which tick is responsible now. So what are we actually doing at the State Health Department, and what can you do to better protect your clients you know, as you become nurses? What can you recommend to your parents, to your kids, to your grandparents, to to you know, your community at large. You know, a lot of the people who have shown up today clearly are, want to be active in their community. What can we do? Um, we can't just spray everything with pesticides. That's not how this works. Ticks are highly focalized and they're very difficult to transmit. Uh, we at the State Health Department don't do any control uh, and you can't, you know, it's very hard to do control for ticks. So, you know, we're, we're not going to focus on every tenant of prevention, but we will talk about repellents. There, you know, when I go out and I talk to people about repellent usage, it's a hard conversation to have. People have very strong opinions about using chemicals on their bodies, and I understand that completely. You know, when you bring up DEET, it can be a difficult conversation or it can be a very easy one. DEET is still the recommended repellent, but there are other options out there. So if you encounter resistance when you talk about DEET, don't talk about DEET that way. Tell them that there are other options, um, but what they have to do is use EPA-approved repellents and follow the directions on the label. Some of these are not okay to put on children um, of a certain age, and they need to know that because if they want to use all natural or more natural products, some of them can't be put on young children. So they have to read those labels to understand how often to reapply. D can be left on for eight hours in most situations. It might need to be reapplied before that, but it's a very effective repellent. Um, I use others, picaridin-based repellents, and one thing that you know, is important to talk about is permethrin-based uh, insecticides that you spray on your clothes. As a person who goes out into the field whenever they let me out of the office, um, what I like to do is I spray down my field clothes with permethrin, which binds to the fabric. It doesn't go through to your skin. And what we're seeing more and more is more uptick of this use. Uh, 
We recommend it all over the place. A lot of people use it. Not only does it repel, it kills the ticks, which is very beneficial for you, but it cannot be applied to skin. So this is something that if you're talking to parents, you know, parents have lots of things to do. So they may not fully read a can, it happens. But they have to be aware of how to use these repellents and insecticides to the best of their ability. So I talked about grabbing your kids when they come back inside, and I am dead serious about that. Grab your kids when they come back inside. Shower soon after you're outdoors, because if they haven't attached, you can wash the ticks right off of you. It can happen. Um, I've done it myself. I've seen them crawling around on the shower floor. Uh, wear light sleeve clothing. You know, we stopped talking about wearing long pants and long shirts in 95 degree weather. Oddly enough, it wasn't getting through. Kids are gonna wear shorts all summer long and in the winter. So I don't know what's up with that, uh, but they do. So wearing light sleeve clothing and long pants whenever possible, especially if you're going out into these environments. I wear very light, uh, I wear khakis if I'm going into the woods just so I can pick them off really easily. And then like we keep reiterating this, please call your doctor if you get fever or rash. Don't take no for an answer. Get in to see your primary care provider as soon as possible. If you have to take a picture of the rash before it disappears, take a picture of the rash. So DEET, permethrin, same thing. Do not apply on the hands or the face of young children and then always follow the directions. There are websites, we have material on our website, there's material on the EPA's website. All of this is out on the web. You can find all of this material out there. And don't be restricted by just one repellent. There are other options. We do recommend DEET, uh, but there are other options. And I've found it a lot easier to communicate with people if I give them several options. Daily tick checks, they are absolutely important, but they will not solve the entire problem unless you take all the required steps. Uh, you do have to check pretty much everywhere, and I'm not gonna go over this. Um, ticks crawl, but UMass actually did a, an interesting study. They asked, uh, they have a tick testing service, and for a small portion of their ticks, they asked, where did you find the tick? And what they found was that people found the ticks on their legs, here, on their sock line, uh, up here. So why is that? Because it's where the, your clothing meets your skin. So ticks crawl, but not very far all the time. And if you need to use your partner to check you over for ticks, uh, please use your partner to check you over for ticks if you have a partner. My wife comes in unbelievably handy when I come home to check me for ticks. And I use her because, you know, she hates it. But I'd rather have that than find like an engorged tick on the back of my head tomorrow. So every time I'm in the woods, that's what I come home and I do. She will not go into the woods with me. Um, I always put this on here. If you work outside in the field and you get back in your car, it's no different than getting back in your house. They can exist in your car for seven, eight days if it's not too hot, and you get back in your car and you feel completely safe. Because one day you're out hiking, the next day you're driving to work, and they're still feeding on you. So it's important to actually check yourself before you get back in the car. Don't go home first, do it right there. I can't tell you, I, you know, I work, I manage our arboviral program at the state laboratory and we have seasonal staff. And I can't tell you how often I reinforce this messaging by opening the door and seeing the tick on the steering wheel. There you go. So the tick's inside waiting for you when you get back in the truck. Tick removal. There are what, a hundred ways to remove a tick. If you go on the web today, you will see the craziest things that you've ever seen for removing a tick. I advocate one policy, one policy only. Uh, grab the tick by the head with fine tip tweezers, pull gently but firmly straight out. It does not matter if you leave the head in there. That's what everybody asks me. I don't care if the head's left inside, your body will reject the head eventually. So what's important to do is you have now a, a small wound. You need to clean that wound appropriately. I use an antibacterial ointment after I've cleaned the wound, and then I cover it up, and I'm fine. It heals over just fine. This, the head will pop out eventually. You just have to be cool with having a head inside of you for a little while. What is very important is that you do not break the tick open. So that's the problem with all of these other ways to, you know, I, everybody said, I put Vaseline on it, you know, eventually it pops out. Unfortunately, it vomited its meal back up onto the open wound. 
So you're increasing your likelihood for transmission. Swirling the tick has become a thing. I've seen videos of this. Well, I mean, I don't know what a tick feels when it gets dizzy, if it gets dizzy, but I know how I feel. And I've seen this technique go horribly wrong when the tick ruptures because it's so large. So think about what you're doing. Pass this along to your children and your friends and your neighbors. There is one good way to remove a tick. There are multiple tools out there. We don't advocate for one tool over another. You'll see tick spoons and all sorts of interesting tick devices. I have access to many fine tip tweezers through my work and I use them and I'm happy with them. But any way that you have to get the tick off in this manner, do that. Something that's really important. So tick attachment time. Everybody thinks that if the tick bites them, they're instantaneously going to get these diseases. That's not true. There have been many studies that show how long it takes to transmit these bacteria. So most of the bacteria are held in the mid-gut of the tick. Uh, so right here. And there's a complex process where it is intaking your blood, and there's a filtering process that's going on into the salivary glands, which are over here, and then that material goes back out. So it takes time for all of that to happen. The shortest period of time for transmission of, this is anaplasma right here, is 12 to 24 hours. And the shortest period of time for Lyme disease is 24 hours. It, it's actually longer than that. So 24 hours is the minimum known time. So if you go out in the woods yesterday at 3 p.m., and today you wake up and you're like, wait a second, I, I saw this tick on me at 10 a.m. and I can get it off then the likelihood that you have transmission of Lyme is almost zero. We just do not see these cases. So you really need to think about getting the tick off ASAP. Babesia is 48 to 56 hours, so very, very long periods of time. And most of these ticks are feeding for about 72 hours. They have to get a large blood meal. One of these things breaks my cycle. Uh, so remove the tick within 24 hours to reduce the risk of your transmission, Powassan virus. Powassan can be transmitted within 15 minutes. It usually takes longer, but since it's so rare, let's follow this instead of the Powassan recommendation. Get the tick off you within 24 hours and you have a good chance of not developing anything, but at least you know you were bitten by a tick and you can watch for the signs and symptoms. Have I scared you enough yet? Everybody feels scared, good, all right. So what are we actually doing? You know, besides collecting data and telling you what to do, and some people are not wearing repellents, come on. Um, I know when I go outside, I don't grab the can of repellent. I'm, I'm the bad person. But for my kid, for like, I have 14 nieces and nephews, I douse them when they come over. I'm like, nope, it's, this is gonna happen. And what are we doing? Well, we have lots of existing materials. We have programs. We have all of this. Um, this is our most requested um, health education material, tick identification card. And it really only has the dog tick and the deer tick. We could put a couple more ticks on there just to confuse you. But this is the one that you need to look out for. And I'm surprised. People carry this in their wallet. They come up and they talk to me about it. And they pull out the tick card. And they show me. And they're really proud of it. And I'm happy. But does this do anything for kids? Like, no kid is reading this. <laughs> Nothing. And we have, a, we have a campaign, ticks are out in mass, mosquitoes are out in mass. Um, and it's a, it's a good campaign, but let's face it, we are the um, state public health department. We are not overflowing with money. As much as you might think we're overflowing with money, we're not. Um, so I was up at 2 a.m. the other uh, night, and I saw a commercial running at 2 a.m., um, and there was a horror movie running. Uh, that I was watching. So I assumed that no children were watching that right then at 2 in the morning. And I assume that parents who are dog tired from dealing with their children all day are not up at 2 in the morning watching this. So we're kind of in a difficult place with our outreach. So how do we reach our targets? Well, I'm going to show you this graph again, just because it's a great graph and I love it. This is, this is my target. This is my personal vendetta for going after this group. So elderly people, we have a different mechanism for targeting them. We go to garden clubs. We'll put up you know, messaging. 
You know, one of my favorite places to go to is the Master Gardening Association. I cannot tell you how much I've learned. I, I'm sorry if I'm getting off topic for anyone who's actually watching this, but go to, a ma go to a gardening show. It is the best thing to do because you will learn so much about gardening and all the bugs that are on your, your plants and how to stop them. Um, I go to those things whenever they let me out of the office. It's my favorite thing to do. So I got to get back to what I was talking about. This age group right here, I really need to do something about that age group because we can target this age group differently. So what am I doing? This. This is my contribution for 15 years of service. No. Uh, we actually asked our public health nurses in Massachusetts, what are your needs? So we do what is called a need assessment. And we put out a questionnaire to all of our public health nurses and all of our boards of health. And I was surprised because when you put out a questionnaire, everybody says they're going to do it, and then they never return it. And it's online. It takes literally five minutes. It's online. What do you need? What can we do to service you? I got 232 responses, which is blows away. That might not sounds like a lot, but there's 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. 232 of them responded to me. That's mind-blowing for me. I, I have to really work hard to get 50 to, to call me back. So every one of them said, I need a tool to target children. Because children come up to my table, they see all of the really fascinating fact sheets that I have here, and then they run away. And you know what happens next? Their parents follow them. They run away. So what can I do to make this more engaging to children? So I have a background in entomology, and I collect a lot of mosquitoes, and we collect a lot of ticks for display purposes. So what we decided to do was rope them in with education. You know, there is no kid out there that doesn't in some way love bugs. I don't care, girls, boys, they love bugs. They just don't like to talk about it. Even they like to be scared, but they like to learn. And that's what we instituted here is their love of science. So we have mosquitoes in a box here that they can come up and they can look at. We have ticks, tick cubes that we can actually, that we, we do, I did these starting in my kitchen at home. My wife was thrilled because there were literally ticks on my, on my counter as I did this. And these are little resin blocks that we make. And the nice thing about these is I have a, a colleague here who's done the same thing. Um, you put them on your skin and you can show people how big the tick is. And as we all get older, I think I've got some extra spots. So it gets harder and harder to see the ticks. And especially here, there's no way to see a tick like that. So it's the concepts that we give them, something real world that we can demonstrate to them. And this has been a very effective tool for us. And it's nice. I have a colleague that, that designed this. I didn't do it. But it, it looks nice. So a lot of this is presentation as well. This is very old school. This, uh, my favorite comment ever was uh, it came from, I want to make sure I'm not going over. I'm just about my time. My favorite comment was, um, it looks like a really good high school student made this. And I was like, that is the best comment I've ever gotten because they were so impressed that a kid made it. Unfortunately, I made it. Um, but I had a lot of help. And what we've designed is um, education tools that go with it. So here's me delivering and talking to a kid. And what this really does is it ropes the children in and it captures their parents. So while the children are distracted and I'm teaching them about ticks and mosquitoes, I or my colleague are grabbing their parents and telling them what we'd like them to do for their kids and themselves. And then grandparents will come up. And then the kids who learned will bring other kids back to the table. So what we've done is we've offered these at no charge to our health departments, as long as they share it with their neighboring communities. So our phase one part was we developed all the content, um, mostly ourselves and through colleagues. Uh, we tested the units. So we've done assessments to see if they work, and they work. Um, they costed initially, each one costed about $500 to make, and I got that cost down to $350 a unit. So I'm very like budget conscious. Um, I make a lot of stuff myself because we don't have any money, which is fine. Um, and then what was our, our next phase was how do we get more of these out? So we actually applied for a grant uh, from the federal government and we showed them how effective this tool was. 
and they provided us with a small grant of $20,000, which enabled us to make a ton of this. And then we had so many health departments that bought into it, we helped them make their own. So right now we have 60 of these traveling across the state and they're used. Uh, we support them and our next phase is to get, try to get them more into the school system. So if there are any teachers in the audience or anybody knows teachers, you guys, they are so bound by the curriculum requirements. They don't have an opportunity to get this in there. So we sneak it in with our public health nurses and anybody that supports this, if, uh, if there are anybody, anyone in the room who wants to do that and just get it into the schools, it's the kids that are the most important thing. Getting that knowledge in there is gonna give them a lifetime of knowledge. So we have some challenges. Um, huge demand, how do we use all of this material? And we had our mascots for some reason visiting our table. Um, and then school use, getting them into schools. Uh, we've over, we have too much demand and we don't have the capacity to continue to produce them, but we're still working on that. So that's all the tick material I have, but I'm happy, and we're up around five o'clock. I think we were going till five, is that right? So, I mean, I love mosquito and tick-borne disease, so if anyone has questions, I've been doing it for a long time. Yes. And it was awesome because there were so many people from away, not from Massachusetts. They had a rapt audience. Yes. And people took the literature, and it's huge over there. Um, but that was great, just being out with the people. We work with um, we work the Barnstable County uh, Extension has a great program. We help them as much as they can. They help us, so we're a really good team. Uh, so that's, uh, that's part of our initiative, and we also have students every year. We have about 50 students that go around the state. They do different projects. Some of them focus on mosquito and tick-borne disease. How beneficial do you think all natural spraying is for yards? Like, do you think so I'm on camera, right? <laughs> okay. So in Massachusetts, at the State Health Department, we don't talk about pesticide use because I don't do anything with pesticides. We actually have a Department of Agricultural Resources, and I know I'm on camera. Um, so there are many services out there. What you need to do as a homeowner is actually look up the efficacy of these natural remedies. Um, oftentimes, you're being sold cedar oils, garlic oils, things like that. Yeah. What's happening in that step is you are basically suffocating the tick. Okay. Um, so when the oil gets on to the tick, it has a, so it's, it's a hard-shelled uh, tick, it's a hard-bodied uh, organism. It has to breathe uh, through that exoskeleton, and it can't when it gets saturated in oil. If you think about it, any oil will actually suffice. So you could use canola oil, which I've got a good chunk of. I wouldn't advocate spraying canola oil in your yard, but know what you're paying for know what's actually in the product that so you know make sure you demand from your service provider exactly what they're using and if they're not willing to tell you it's basically everything that you said that's why i'm questioning it because i have children and i yep. have animals and yeah. i just want to be conscientious about what i'm paying for and if it is effective absolutely and i think that's a that's what i tell a lot of people and most of the you know some of the all-natural stuff um, pyrethroids were developed, uh, they're synthetic chemicals, they were developed from chrysanthemums, so now they're marketing products that are coming from chrysanthemums that they can call all natural. What is the level of toxicity versus the artificial products? So that's not as well understood, so as a homeowner and, and a mother, it's important for you to know what service you're buying and what you're getting. And if they will not tell you and they will not give you the information, and if it sounds too good to be true, we all know the added from that. So I say just um, be cautious when you're doing those things. There are tools that you can use yourself as a homeowner, um, and you can look those up online, but they're very useful and, and potentially less expensive. You could carry ferrets everywhere you go, but I don't think it's going to work. Easy remedies. No, it's really taking away their uh, habitat. So it's all about habitat. Um, last year, so there are a lot of cycles drive mice. 
If you think about last year, we had a large acorn mass. So all of those acorns, they feed not only the squirrels and chipmunks, but they're also feeding the mice. Um, the more acorns we have, the more mice you're going to have. So in, in lean years, you have a lot of die-offs. In heavy years, you build the population up explosively. That's what we're going to have here. Um, it's all about your yard. So creating the least friendly environment for mice as you possibly can. If you have stone walls, there's, you know, most of us are not going to move the wall. But keeping the children away from the wall, because that's where the ticks are most likely to be, that's where the mice are. But if you have wood piles or piles of brush or anything that can support mice, making sure that there isn't food. I feed birds, um, but, I, but I'm aware of it. If you don't think mice at night are under that bird feeder or, or at the bird feeder, they are. So you're supporting not only the birds and the huge squirrels, but you're supporting the mice. So you have to think about what you're adding into the environment and how you can change your environment uh, without changing your lifestyle. Yeah. Do you know why the mouse is a particularly you know, effective vector versus a squirrel or a rabbit? Or it's not that they're less, so it's not that they're necessarily, their chipmunks are harboring these diseases as well. So it's not that one versus the other is happening, but the white-footed mouse does harbor these diseases pretty well. It's a very competent, it doesn't succumb to them. So the question is, what is the overall, I, I, I hate to, I don't want to keep you, but I, I do like all of this stuff. So um, every disease has an impact on every organism. So how does it impact the fertility or, or the fecundity of it? Does it actually kill the mouse? And in this case, you're not getting a die off in mice. They're used to carrying these organisms around. In other cases, it might actually impact the animal. And if you think about the volume of animals, it's volume too. So more mice than squirrels, more mice than chipmunks. And they also occupy um, the right habitat for ticks to get at as well. What's that? Um, if, if an animal can feed upon mice, um, can they get um, Lyme disease as well? Oh, so you're saying anything that eats the, the organisms? Generally not. So if it goes through the gut, it, most of those organisms are being dissolved on the way down. They're not really good at surviving that environment. It's really an injection situation. They're very fragile organisms, really. And honestly, by the time they get into, so they have to go through, I told you that they're going through that whole process, this loop where the blood's getting in, and by then it's a very harsh process for the, these organisms to go through. So the survival rate for some of them is pretty low. So then they're injecting and then replicating inside of you. So the likelihood that they're infecting the other animals is pretty low. That doesn't mean that the ticks aren't feeding on birds, which they are, but they don't act as very competent vectors and there's not, as amplifiers, there's not as many of them either. Yeah. And yeah, and we also don't recommend the, um, those, the cotton balls with permethrin. So if you use those in your yard, have you ever seen them? Yeah. If you haven't seen them, then don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, the tick tubes. Uh, just from a state perspective, if you like them, we never tell you what to do. Um, from a state perspective, we're, we don't necessarily believe that they're an effective tool. Um, by the way, they cost a lot, and they are cotton balls sprayed with permethrin, which you have a can and you have a bag of cotton balls, and if you can't put those into a cylinder, I, I don't know what to do. So instead of paying $30, if you really want to use those, but the wrong animals are probably using them, and we're also putting a lot of insecticide into the environment with unknown consequences. So if we do want to control the ticks, what's happening to that cycle if we're removing them from some? So we don't think the white-footed mice are really utilizing the cotton balls that much. So the ones that we want to target, we're not targeting. So we think it's more of a marketing issue. Yeah. People are desperate. Any other questions? So, Matthew, one thing I believe is, is true um, is the reduction in the red fox. Um, as the coyotes have been coming in to, I know it's true in Rhode Island. Certainly yeah. true in Rhode Island. Yeah. Um, as the coyotes come in, uh, they tend to eat the, the, the red fox are a meal for the coyotes. Um, a white mouse or a, a chipmunk is not even an appetizer. Uh, so we can have that challenge too. 
Yeah, so you've made a really good point. Um, and I apologize, I know it's after our time, so if anyone needs to leave, I won't be offended at all. But um, a really good point has been made. Based on how we live, our environment has drastically changed. The predators that we had to control certain populations, they're not there. Once coyotes enter an environment, the smaller level predators disperse. They cannot compete against a coyote. So a coyote is not going to go after mice. It's gonna to have to go after larger prey. You think bigger animals, they need bigger prey. So when you drive out and, you've, and you really fragment that natural cycle, you have unintended consequences. So that's what we're seeing. I, te I, I actually live in a more um, rural area than I did a little while ago, and my prior house was that fragmented, there were just coyotes and there were no foxes, there was nothing and it was covered in ticks, covered in ticks. And I loved that I could go out and collect ticks easily. My new home, I can't collect ticks very easily. It's driving me nuts. But I see foxes, and I've seen fisher and mink and other things, and we tend not to see coyotes invading it because there's a lot of differing habitat. So this is a, it's a pretty well-studied and emerging thought process about how we've manipulated our environment to cause some of these problems. I think, it's, I think there are many variables in this situation. Climate change is very difficult to assess. I look at it from a mosquito perspective a lot because you know, mosquitoes are, they are dependent upon precipitation so, and heat. So the more heat you have, the more precipitation you have, uh, the more mosquitoes you're going to have. But there's so many variables in climate change. You can have intense precipitation like last summer. Um, but if you have too much precipitation, you can't heat up the water as fast. So even if you had real, so the more water you have, the more heat you have to introduce into the system. So there are all of these variables that impact each system. Climate change certainly welcomes more survival. So it's all about mortality. Um, a lot of sites out there will tell you that winter has no impact on ticks, and that's not entirely true. If there's no insulating snow cover, and you get a really cold winter like we had a couple of years ago, you will get decreased populations. It's not gonna hit them super hard, but it's gonna help. If you get really dry conditions, it's also going to help because they need that moisture. But if you get a mild winter like we had, and earlier springs, later winters, so the, you know the trend we're having where everything starts to shorten, we needed that temperate climate to maintain this cycle and it's starting to become more difficult and that's what I think that's what we're seeing. It's just more, it's a longevity issue, more time for transmission, more survival, which equals more survival on the other end. So there's not one variable that explains everything. So uh, you know, we had many good points brought up here. There's not one thing, it's a constant, I think we're all starting to understand that it was never one thing. It was one thing starts to impact 20 things. So it's very hard to wrap your head around how 10 years from now the situation will look. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much.